for joining us this morning on Leading Edge. I'm Amanda Fay and for Jerry Anderson. Now we've talked a lot about how to end violence in our community. One focus the past couple summers in particular is programming for our kids. Joining me this morning is Karen Randy Wilkins with the City of Toledo Parks Department. The planning has already begun for this summer, hasn't it? It has long before now, I'm sure. Yes, and you know, last year this there was a lot for kids to do. And what, what types of program did we see last summer? We, well, we had over 100 programs, unique programs, and ranged everything from what you'd expect to find, like athletics and fitness, sports, that sort of thing, to arts, theater, spoken word, broadcasting. Um, th there was construction camps, there was fishing camps, there was learning how to play golf. I mean, just a whole host of things. Mm -hmm. Something really for just about any child, I think. Any kid could get excited about, and as we mentioned, we, we really want to keep them busy with some positive activities. And um, right now is that time period that you're looking for people in the community, these organizations, to come in and step up and say, you know, I want to provide that programming. So uh, w what are you looking for right now? How could people get involved here? Well, we have $2 million that we're going to be giving away for the 2023 summer and 23-24 school year. So if you are interested in programming through any of that time period, there is an application available. If you go to the city website and type in youth grants in the search field, it'll take you right to the application. It's all online. It's pretty straightforward and fairly simple. Very intuitive, you know, the questions that you would be ex expect to be asked. Mm -hmm. But, you know, make application. We have grants that we will be sharing ranging from $1,000 to $50,000. Mm -hmm. So it's real money. Mm -hmm. And um, we've done some, we've supported some amazing organizations already in the last couple of years, and we hope to do so again this year. You know, when, you, when we look back at last year, you know, how, how was participation? Were you all pleased with the amount of kids who were, who were signing up for these? You know, we, ha we do keep track, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to, to do an unduplicated number, but we had over 40,000 touch points with children. A lot of that's unduplicated, but some of it is duplicated. So like at the swimming pool, if you've got a child who goes swimming three times a week, you know, you count them every time they go. Mm -hmm. But um, so over 40,000 touch points with kids and really, you know, started from the minute school got out and all through the summer. And then we've extended it with school year programming. So so not just the summer here, you know, kids will have those maybe after school after programs school, that they'll be able to go yeah. to. After, a lot of basketball programs, a lot of mentoring programs, mm -hmm. a lot of fun things that they can try, new things. Mm -hmm. So is there anything particular that you really want to be able to provide? Maybe you didn't provide last year or um, that maybe somebody's already signed up and raised their hand to provide? Well, we want to provide a wide variety of opportunities for the kids, things that are going to be interesting to them. And I think that a lot of our programming partners in the community know what those things are. But in particular, we have a, a keen interest in making sure we've got a lot of mentoring going on. So that would be, a, a, I think, a real bonus if you could fold mentoring into your program. I think it happens naturally. If you're doing good programming, mentoring happens. But that's an important piece for us mm -hmm. um, and for our, for our youth in particular. Uh, beyond that, we'd love to see some programming in the parks, so if, in the city parks. So mm -hmm. if, if people could think about if that makes sense for their activity, if they could do it on the platform of a park, mm -hmm. that would help activate our spaces a little bit more. So, but beyond that, we, we're really quite open-minded about what what we're going to see, mm -hmm. and um, we're excited about some of the variety and. I'm looking forward to that. I think we were we were playing some video a second ago, and I remember this from last summer and thought it was really interesting. There was like a drum line <laughs> was one of the programs that was offered. That was really cool. There it is, yeah, and that was a really unusual one and, and done in a very small park on the east side and very very well attended and and a lot of kids were very excited about it. We want to you know get our kids exposed to things that may they may not otherwise have done. There was also an equestrian camp, um, fishing camp, uh, so all kinds of Broadcasting, I think we talked yeah, a little bit about some of that. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. So why is it so important? And I know uh, this isn't just done by the city. You, you know, it's it's with all of these supported uh, the organizations that are stepping up to the plate to do this. But why is it so important to facilitate all of this programming for kids for the summer? I think kids want to be engaged. They want to have fun things to do, interesting things to do. They want to learn. They want to grow. They don't. They want to, that to continue throughout the summer. You know, a lot of people think, oh, kids just want to sleep in and be lazy. But in truth, I think kids want to be active and interested and engaged. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very important thing to, in, to offer those programs. And our program partners clearly 
have got it nailed, and they're getting better every year. So, I and I think more of that. parents too. I would have to imagine that you know I have a five-year-old, um, not quite at that school age yet, but getting there. And so you know over those summer months, you know parents are working, and you know they might not be able to just watch the kids all day every day. Um, so this is an opportunity to send them to a safe space for them absolutely. to be. Absolutely, absolutely. There's and there's great socialization that's happening. You know, there's great. You know, you find people who care about you. A lot of kids need that, to have that kind of touch point during the summer. We make sure that the kids are well fed in a lot of mm -hmm. these programs. So that's another important component. And uh, yeah, it's, it's gonna be a fun summer. It's gonna be a fun summer. We're, we're in February now, so we're going, oh man. <laughs> but, but we're gonna get there here soon. But actually the deadline is approaching quickly is. for these folks in the community to get themselves signed up for a piece of that $2 million pie. <laughs> Correct. It is. Um, so this coming Friday, mm -hmm. midnight, um, get your application in before then. Again, go to the website, Google that, or search that uh, youth grants, mm -hmm. and just st start right in. If you ha are having problems, you can contact us, but it's a pretty straightforward little application. So. And you ha already have some folks who have... We do. We some. probably have over 20 so far, and we would expect to get a lot more. Right. Right, okay, well, clock's ticking though, so make sure you, you get signed up because we do want to provide a really great summer for our kids and, and hopefully, you know, keep them out of trouble and keep them into some positive activities. Amen. Very good, Karen. Thank you so much for joining Thank us you. today. And coming up after the break, more from the city of Toledo on a program to help people pay their rent. That's next on Leading Edge. Welcome back. Well, many families have fallen on hard times during the pandemic and with inflation at the highest level in decades, the need for helping to pay those bills is growing. My next guest this morning, Housing Commissioner for the City of Toledo, Tiffany McNair. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the city recently got some additional funding to help folks pay their rent. What, $34 million? Is that right? Yeah, we were able to uh, be awarded this money. Um, the state of Ohio was so gracious to voluntarily return some of its ERA2, and that's emergency rental assistance, um, back to the U.S. Department of Treasury. And when they did that, they recommended that the city of Toledo be the recipient of those funds. So we went ahead, we did our paperwork to say that we would accept, and that's what we did, and we got the $34 million. Nice. So how big of a need is there in our community for this? Well, in the city of Toledo, we actually have a really high renters population, so about 50% or more. And of our renters, about 46% of those are cost burden. That means they're paying more than 30% of their earnings mm -hmm. towards housing needs. Mm -hmm. And um, that is in comparison with only 21% of homeowners being cost burden. So what that means is that if one is having to choose to pay the rent, the electric bill, the gas bill, they may have to cut back on other things that allow them to just, you know, live the life that we all want to live and, and be able to enjoy some of the extras that come with it. Mm -hmm. It's a big chunk, you know, more than 30%, mm -hmm. you know, just on the roof over your head. So uh, it should hopefully be a big help. Uh, you know, who qualifies for this uh, and how do people know whether or not they're eligible for the assistance? So households that have had a COVID-19 impact that could be directly, indirectly, or just during the pandemic, they can qualify as long as they do not exceed 80% of our area median income. Mm -hmm. And we have that information available on our City of Toledo Department of Housing and Community Development website. Mm -hmm. And it's also available on HUD's website if someone just wanted to know what that was so they could check for just any household that they want across the country. So those are the families that we are targeting, families and individuals, because it's not required that you have more than one person in the in the household so those folks that have had some type of COVID-19 impact or just during the pandemic they are eligible to apply and their case will be reviewed by either the city of Toledo staff or one of our partner agencies which includes NeighborWorks Toledo Region Pathway Incorporated Lutheran Social Services and the Toledo Lucas County Homelessness Board you know, a lot of huge impacts during the pandemic, during COVID, you know, people just being out of work, you know, if something mm -hmm. was closed or an illness, things like that. So I would imagine that uh, there will be people who are, you know, applying for that. How does this assistance come? Is it, you know, a check or, you know, how, how does that all work? So we have two options when it comes to the rent part of the um, assistance. So the rent can be made payable directly to the um, landlord who would have applied in our portal to receive the payment, and that includes completing a W-9. 
And if the landlord chooses not to participate, the Treasury Department did allow for some elbow room and some flexibility mm -hmm. to mail those payments directly to the tenant. When it comes to the utility payment or the internet payments, those checks are mailed directly to the provider. It's easy and they are more than happy to take the payment and apply <laughs> it to the accounts. Okay, mm -hmm. so, you know, can really, you know, help just uh, give somebody some breathing room, you know. Oh, sure, and actually want want. help someone bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. So they may have had um, where they were off a few weeks or even a few months with um, issues related to COVID-19, and then they were able to get this assistance and, you know, position themselves back to move forward afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, we are focusing now this money on housing stability efforts, and we are going to put some of the, the dollars into the investment of affordable housing development and preservation of current affordable housing units. So, you know, moving forward, there will be more of a permanent permanency here with this Absolutely. Money. That's what we want to do. We, we know that this is a temporary um, assistance program, uh, emergency assistance, and we hope all emergencies are temporary. Um, so we are looking long term about how we can go about helping our um, constituents and the, the community to a more self-reliant way of maintaining their housing. And so that is something that will come with this, you know, 34, 34 million, you know, it's a, it's a nice little chunk there. And then to be able to help people now, but then to be able to help people there in the future. As Absolutely. Well. The city of Toledo is operating at a deficit of about 12,000 affordable housing units. So uh, having this allowance to invest um, approximately $8.5 million into affordable housing development and preservation, we're hoping that that makes a difference. It's not huge where we'll you know we'll say we'll give you six thousand of those twelve thousand that you're you're at a loss for but it still makes a difference over time that we can do something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so is there a deadline for people to apply for this and how do they go about doing that at this time we don't have a deadline we just want to operate as long as the need is there and if someone is interested in applying they could go to toledo.oh.gov slash renters and there's a little button that says apply here. They click the button, apply online. If they need help, they can call our team or call one of our partner agencies, ask for an appointment, and someone will sit down with them and complete the application. It could be a little, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, over people's heads sometimes mm -hmm. and just overwhelming. So to be able to sit down with somebody, have you have you know, walk them through that process can be can be a really good thing for people. Sure. Very yeah. Good. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yep. Well, more to come on Leading Edge. February is heart month, and I'm going to be talking with a cardiologist about the risks of heart disease and what we can all do to help save lives. Stay with us. Well, it's the month of February, a time to focus on taking care of our hearts. Joining me now, Dr. Heminder Singh, a cardiologist with Mercy Health. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So um, you're with uh, Mercy Health, but tell me a little bit more about where you practice. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists. I primarily work with Toledo Cardiology Consultants at St. Vincent Hospital. Okay, so this month we're talking a lot about it. Uh, heart disease, you know, heart month. So how exactly prevalent is heart disease? Well, I think majority of us know uh, uh, heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States and worldwide, years after years. And if we look at the database from American Heart Association, around 120 million adult Americans have some form of heart disease, out of which coronary artery disease, which is blockages in the heart arteries, is the most prevalent. On average, around 800,000 Americans suffer from heart attack every single year and that makes it for one every 40 seconds as we talk. So it's quite prevalent and scary trend. Wow, and what are the risk factors? I think we hear you know, about these things uh, a lot, but it's, it's just good to remind people because you know, as, we, as our lives change, maybe our risk factors do as well. Absolutely, there are numerous risk factors for heart disease. Uh, the traditional ones are smoking, and there's a reason I put it at number one. Mm -hmm. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, family history of heart attacks, and then the other risk factors are being overweight, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, uh, <clears throat> and uh, um, stress, 
Huh. Okay. <laughs> I think we could all probably identify with that one at, yes. the, at the very least. So, you know, I, I, how do, but th these are risk factors, but they're also preventable, right? So there are things Correct. that we could do within our lifestyles. Absolutely. I think in order to make a larger impact on the community, I would act at three levels. One is at the level of patients or the general population. Secondly, at the level of healthcare providers. And third, at the system. If I talk about for my viewers or uh, general population, how we can prevent it, there are certain essential health behaviors we should all adopt. The first of all will be stay away from smoking, any kind. Is it vaping, active smoking, passive smoking, e-cigarettes, any kind of smoking, stay away from it. Secondly, eat healthy diet, which every cardiologist is going to encourage Mediterranean style diet which means fish and <laughs> a lot of fish, a lot of fruits, vegetables, mm -hmm. incorporate complex uh, carbohydrates like mm -hmm. grains and uh, uh, more meatless meals. Third, if you have any of risk factors for heart disease, go see a doctor or a cardiologist, have a regular checkups at least once a year so that we can diagnose those risk factors and treat them straight away. Mm -hmm. Last but not the least, if you have any symptoms related to heart disease. For example, chest pain, pressure, shortness of breath, jaw pain, neck pain, any dizziness, lightheadedness, it's advisable to seek immediate medical attention. Do not ignore them. And I think uh, for women too, a lot of times those symptoms could be, you know, a little Atypical. bit different, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, and some that we ignore here and there, don't we? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, putting our putting ourselves first. And I think for some people that might be a little bit different, d difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, you're taking care of families, you're busy, things like that. But those symptoms might might be there that you're pushing aside. Correct. And we have seen it a lot during these days, post-COVID pandemic days, or during the pandemic days. A lot of people got. Uh, ignored uh, with people with existing heart disease could not seek care because of this care and then a lot of atypical symptoms in younger population mm -hmm. across ages so we need to be a little bit extra careful this time yeah. you know it's been in the news actually like a lot lately we have football players Demar Hamlin who we saw what happened with him in that mm -hmm. cardiac uh, arrest that happened there on the football field um, and he's raising awareness now with a campaign that he just came out with but there were people there immediately on the sidelines ready to jump in there to perform that CPR, you know. Uh, talk about the importance of that. CPR is a very critical life-saving maneuver, and I think everyone should know how to do it. The reason is CPR <clears throat> can not only save a life, but it can prevent permanent brain damage. Mm. What happens is that when heart stops, <clears throat> the brain can only survive only a few minutes without oxygen. So it's really, really critical to jump on, start the CPR, pump blood to the brain as soon as possible. And a systematic and timely CPR can save life as well as uh, prevent a person who survives from permanent disabilities. So it is noticed that uh, around 35% of cardiac arrest are witnessed by the bystanders. Mm -hmm. That bystander could be you, me, or any of our viewers. So everyone should learn it. They can save a life. Secondly, CPR gives you a training or develops a skill or knowledge in you where you can act in an emergent situation. It teaches you how to stay calm, how to coordinate with the team, and build self-confidence in you. And lastly, you can make your workplace or school safer if you know CPR. Uh, I know Damar Hamlin has been pushing for it with the uh, heart org, uh, CPR.heart.org, and I would encourage everyone to definitely entertain and uh, get trained with CPR. You just never know. And I think I would feel better knowing that maybe my coworkers or, you know, where, wherever so, I'm going to be if, right. if folks are trained. Uh, people might be a little bit nervous, you know, to, to jump in in these sort of situations. Maybe they'll hurt somebody or, you know, there, there are some fears there, but, but really they, people just shouldn't be afraid. Yes, I think uh, with the awareness with these high-profile cases, uh, and uh, I've seen a lot of good trends on social media lately where a lot of people are, uh, who were reluctant, they, are, they have decided to sign up for CPR, which is a good trend. And also American Heart Association recently removed the mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation part. So hands-only CPR, uh, more people are more comfortable with it and they are signing up. And uh, uh, as we go out of the pandemic, people are more confident getting trained for CPR. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, as we go through February here, we're kind of just getting started, you know, is there anything that you would just, you know, a message that you have for, for viewers or something, that, any final thoughts that you want to provide for them? <laughs> Absolutely. I would say uh, this is a good opportunity for uh, all of us to focus more on our heart and identify our risk factors, eat healthy, stay away from smoking, and keep your heart safe. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed um, with patients, as you mentioned during the pandemic, just people not necessarily getting screenings or maybe even going in for physicals, things like that, you know? That's right. We saw a lot of uh, heart, heart disease patients who came after the pandemic and they were not in good shape because they had uh, they could not seek care for several months, even when they're sick and they had symptoms. They were very reluctant to go into the hospital with the scare of uh, getting contracting COVID-19. Uh, but things are changing, and uh, I'm glad they are. Yeah. So uh, you know, do the do what you need to do for yourself, for your family, because we, you know there's, there's nothing worse than than having to lose a family member too soon. That's you right. know, over something that could hopefully be prevented in, in many cases. Absolutely. So. Heart disease is preventive mm -hmm. and it can be prevented. A lot Very of times, good. Yeah. Dr. Singh, thank you so much for My joining pleasure. us. Yeah. We appreciate it and hopefully uh, inspire some people to make some healthy choices, get Absolutely. up, get moving, eat better, stop smoking, those, those habits. So thank you so much for joining You're us. You're welcome. We Thanks. It. And we'll be right back with more Leading Edge. Well, thank you so much for watching and thank you to all my guests, Karen Ranny Wilkins and Tiffany McNair from the city of Toledo talking about some important programming for both our kids this summer and also for families who may be struggling to pay those rent bills. And also Dr. Heminder Singh from Mercy Health with some great tips to live a longer, healthier life. If you missed part of the show, you'll be able to watch the whole thing on our WTOL 11 YouTube page. We hope you have a great week.